initiative that you're working on is like the million molecule challenge, which I think is really interesting. Um, So can you explain, I guess, A, why you're doing this? What what is the kind of idea behind it? And uh, how will you be scanning so many molecules? Sure. Yeah. So, so the, the reason why um, we am kind of embarked on this and I, and I will say, you know, the million molecule challenge is where we ended up. We didn't start there. We started actually with a hundred thousand. Uh, I think that's what I initially proposed. Um, but the reason for wanting to be able to screen a hundred thousand or now a million interventions um, is driven in large part by my perception, and I think other some other people share this perception, but it's certainly my perception that the field of aging biology or geroscience or longevity, whatever you want to call it, the field has in many ways become quite narrow over the last 15 years. And what I mean by that is if you look at the, the things that people are studying, they all sort of fall into the framework of the hallmarks of aging. And that makes sense because that's what most people know about the biology of aging. We've got the hallmarks of aging. We should study them. And I, I agree with that, except I think that there's actually more that we don't know than we do know about the biology of aging. And I worry that by becoming very narrowly focused on what we know, we're missing out on what we don't know. And, and I also worry that the field has sort of achieved incremental advances when it comes to new interventions for impacting the biology of aging. And what I mean by that is, and you sort of alluded to this a a, a few minutes ago, you know, we've known about rapamycin, its effects on lifespan in mice since 2009, its effects on lifespan in yeast since 2006, mTOR since 2003. So 20 years, we've known about this protein, 17 years, we've known about the drug and its effects on lifespan. Why is it still the best we've got? Mm-hmm. Right. If the field is making so much progress, so many advances, why haven't we done better than rapamycin in almost two decades? And I think in part that's because everybody's studying the same thing. So you're not going to find anything better than the best in class if you don't study something other than what you already know. That's my that's my perception. So so this, you know, this is something that's been bothering me, as you might be able to tell, for a few years now. And about five years ago, I kind of was like, okay, so that's a problem. What's the solution? And I think there are many ways to tackle that solution. Again, the problem, I, in my view, is the narrowing of the scope of the field. What's the solution? And there are other people out there thinking of other solutions. I don't want to say this is the best solution, certainly not the only solution. But the solution I came up with was to return to, to some extent, an unbiased approach of discovering new longevity interventions. Instead of saying, okay, we already understand the biology enough, we're going we're gonna to focus on what we think is important, let the biology tell us what's important. And the way to do that is to take a step back and just screen things randomly. Don't go in with preconceived notions. So in order to do that, you have to have the capacity to be able to do thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of experiments. So that was the conceptual leap, in my mind at least, that got me started down this path. And so then the question became, if longevity is the thing we're interested in, that's what we should be looking at. So how do we design a system where we can do 100,000 longevity experiments in my career, right? (laughs) Um, And if you look at what the field's doing, you know, it's maybe, maybe 5,000 longevity experiments, everybody in the world combined, maybe 5,000 a year, maybe 10,000 a year. So this is sort of order of magnitude change that needed to happen. And so So in thinking about that, it occurred to me, okay, mice are off the table. It's going to take billions of dollars to do 100,000 experiments in mice. Plus, then you have the ethical questions, should we even do that? Um, So we have to do this in an invertebrate model. And C. elegans occurred, it it seemed to me that C. elegans was a good place to do that. So then we developed this technology called the Wormbot, which I'm happy to talk about, but it doesn't really matter other than it's a Mm -hmm. tool we built that combines robotics with artificial intelligence that now allows us to do hundreds of thousands of experiments in a few years. And we've gotten that technology to the point where we believe with relatively modest resources, so less than $5 million, we believe we can we can test a million interventions for their effects on lifespan and health span in C. elegans. That's the million molecule challenge. Sleep is the key to your body's rejuvenation and repair process. It controls hunger and weight loss hormones 
boosts energy levels and impacts countless other vital functions. During the holiday season, it's easy to slip from our health routine and have more late nights and eat irregularly. In fact, drinking more than two servings of alcohol per day for men and more than one for women can decrease sleep quality by 39.2%, according to a study from Tampere University in Finland. But when the vacation season winds down, it's time to get back on track and focus on healthy eating, exercise, and above all, quality sleep. For my sleep, I take Magnesium Breakthrough by Bioptimizers because it contains all seven forms of magnesium. I take it every evening and it helps me fall asleep, stay asleep, and wake up refreshed. Visit magnesiumbreakthrough.com slash modern and enter code 10 for 10% off your order of Magnesium Breakthrough. Thank you for your Challenge. support. And it's not, a we, million molecules is kind of catchy, but it'll actually be combinations of molecules uh, because we think combinations actually have a better chance of really moving the needle in terms of longevity. And what I can tell you from the pilot screens we've done of just several thousand, which by the way, is more than everything that's in the drug age database combined. So just in a few months with just a few devices, we've got more data than everybody else in the world has, at least what's publicly available. So just to give you a feel of scale here, um, I can tell you already, we will find things that are better than the current best in class. We already have. There is no question in my mind it is absolutely no question. We will find things that are twice as good, three times as good, four times as good as rapamycin, at least in worms. I think it's a legitimate question. Will we find things that are three times, four times as good as rapamycin in mice? I don't know the answer to that. What I can tell you is what we know from, from history is many of the interventions that increase lifespan in worms also increase lifespan in mice. And I think it's perfectly reasonable to expect that if something is twice as good as rapamycin in a, in a worm, at least sometimes it's gonna be twice as good as rapamycin in a mouse, we're gonna find dozens, if not hundreds of these things. So to me, this is one of those really low hanging fruit, so obvious this should be done sorts of projects that you know we just gotta figure out how to pay for it. And that's what we're trying to do right now. Right. So if you find something, would you plan to take it forward or would you hope that somebody else would take it forward? Yeah, I mean, I think all everything's on the table, right? So, mm -hmm. so, so we have spun this out as a company because it was very, very difficult to get any traction in the academic world for this. We'll mm -hmm. see if, if we can do better in the, in the for-profit world. My preference, again, I, I'm an academic at heart. My, my preference would be to make all of the data publicly available and we're open to that, right? Again, somebody has got to pay for it. So if a nonprofit mm -hmm. wants to say, here's the money, you do it, make the database publicly available, we'll, we'll do that, right? If it's got to be done through venture capital and taken through the, the, the traditional mm -hmm. biotech route, out license it to another company, develop it in-house, we'll do it, right? I'm more about, at this point in my career, I'm, I'm more about, we got to do these things and you know other people can spend years talking about it. I want to actually do it because this is important and it needs to be done. And you know we'll, we'll do what it will, we just have to figure out how we get the resources to actually make this happen. Um, I think in reality, what'll happen at Aura, the company, is we will have so many good candidates to follow up, some of which will work in mice, that we will end up licensing some of them out to other companies to be developed through the traditional biotech route. Um, and some of them will keep in-house. And there are multiple paths you can go down. And again, the system is somewhat agnostic to what the what the molecule is. These could be current, these could be already FDA approved drugs. They could be natural products that could go directly to market if they're generally recognized as safe. They could be new pharmaceuticals. They could be, you know, drug libraries that are that are a mixture of different types of molecules, right? So so one of the things is if you can screen a million interventions, you can do all of that, right? Mm -hmm. So there are multiple opportunities, I think, for revenue down the road for the company. One of the challenges is this isn't a cookie cutter company. It's not the one molecule, one indication biotech that at least traditional venture funds are used to funding. So it's a different model. And I think one of our challenges is we've got to find, we've got to align with the right funders who can see the impact large impact because look, I'm interested in moving the needle. I'm not interested in finding something that's 
almost as good as rapamycin or half as good as rapamycin, but that I can get FDA approval with, I want something that's better than rapamycin. Um, so we got to align ourselves with the right funders who can really see that this is a game changer and not a cookie cutter. And so that's that's kind of where we're at now. But um, I think there are multiple paths to pass the revenue. Um, and again, just based on our pilot screens, I, I think there is no doubt in my mind, we are going to have multiple things that are far better than anybody else has right now. And I've got to believe there's going to be a market for those five years from now, or three years from now, or whenever we get there. Okay, that is amazing. And it, it's great that you're doing that. Uh, it does seem, yeah, like the unbiased screening of large quantities of molecules. Uh, seems yeah. like and that, let me just say that that's uh, that's being done in the context of Aura Biomedical, O-R-A, right. just for people who are interested in finding out more.